So uh, good afternoon and welcome to today's virtual visit with Maine's Puffins. I hope that you and your families are safe and healthy during this COVID-19 crisis that we all find ourselves in. My name is Todd Martin. I'm the Grassroots Outreach Coordinator at the Natural Resources Council of Maine. NRCM is a nonprofit membership organization protecting, restoring, and conserving Maine's environment now and for future generations. For more than 60 years, the Natural Resources Council of Maine has been protecting the places, the way of life, uh, and the places that make Maine so special. NRCM harnesses the power of the law, science, and the voices of more than 25,000 supporters statewide and beyond. Our office is located in Augusta, just steps from the State House. Uh, before we get started with our program, uh, just a few notes about the Zoom webinar technology that we're using this afternoon. So today's webinar is being recorded, and uh, tomorrow morning you'll receive an email uh, with a link to watch the recording at your convenience. Um, your video and your audio is disabled uh, for today's program by design. You'll only be able to see and hear uh, our presenters uh, that we have on the program this afternoon. If you have a question or a comment for uh, either of our presenters, uh, please type it into the question and answer box which you can find at the ribbon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we'll have plenty of time for questions and answer uh, after Steve and Don's presentation. Um, like you, uh, I wish that we could be together in person uh, on the Hardy Boat Tour cruise out of South Bristol to see these beautiful puffins uh, in real life uh, out at Eastern Egg Rock. Uh, but because of COVID, we're un unable to be with you today uh, in person. Um, but uh, we have the next best thing here today. Uh, we have a virtual trip. Uh, and one advantage of this kind of virtual boat that we're all on today uh, is that it has the capacity to fit everybody on board. And we're so glad that you're, you're here with us today. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn, turn it over to Allison Wells, who is NRCM's Senior Director of Public Affairs and Communications to introduce our two panelists. Allison. Thanks, Todd. We are so fortunate to have two of the world's top seabird experts and conservationists with us here today, Dr. Stephen Kress and Dr. Donald Lyons. Many of you know Steve by his more official and formal name, Puffin Man. I've been fortunate to have known Steve for many years, going back to our Cornell days, and I've been pleased that in recent years, NRCM has been able to work with him on an annual Puffin trip. Uh, Dr. Kress is founder of National Audubon Society's Project Puffin, and a visiting fellow of the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. He previously served as Vice President of Bird Conservation for the National Audubon Society and Director of the Hog Island Audubon Camp in Bremen, Maine. In his career, he's done some pretty cool stuff, including developing techniques for managing colonial nesting seabirds. Hundreds of professional seabird biologists got their start as interns with Project Puffin. Indeed, many innovative seabird conservation methods developed right here in Maine are now standard practice worldwide. Dr. Kress received his PhD from Cornell University and his master's and undergraduate degrees from Ohio State University. He's co-author of the book, Project Puffin, The Improbable Quest to Bring a Beloved Seabird Back to Egg Rock, and the forthcoming book for early readers, The Puffin Plan. Dr. Kress is editor and presenter for new online courses about raptors and seabirds from the Hog Island Audubon Camp. Dawn is a newer acquaintance of mine, but I'd heard many great things about him from my husband, Jeff, who works with Don on a number of projects at National Audubon. <clears throat> We're excited that he could be on this virtual boat with us today as well. Dr. Lyons is Director of Conservation Science for National Audubon Society Seaward Institute and, assistant, and an Assistant Professor in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at Oregon State University. He has studied seabirds for more than 20 years, applying his findings to a variety of conservation challenges in locations ranging from the Gulf of Maine to Southeast Asia. His current efforts focus on the impacts of climate change on seabirds and the restoration of vulnerable seabird populations. Dr. Lyons also men mentors numerous early and mid-career conservation biologists and serves as an educator in a variety of settings. He received his PhD from Oregon State University, an MS from the University of California, Berkeley, and a BS degree from Iowa State University. Don and his wife, along with their canine companions, are fortunate enough to spend summers here in Midcoast, Maine, and winters in Western Oregon. Welcome, Steve and Don. Now on to the puffins. 
terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Todd, for organizing the technology. So important here. And Allison, for your good words and for sparing embarrassing stories about our explorations with puffins and birds in the past. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure always to, to uh, present to NRCM. You know that the, the uh, puffin cruise has always been a, been a highlight uh, of my year and the, and the good work of NRCM saving wildlife, saving wild places, parallels the work of Audubon. Uh, and I, I think we're such great partners. So it's fun to, to uh, give you all this update and to let Don uh, be part of this as well as the new leader of the um, Seabird Institute, what we're calling Project Puffin uh, these days. So I, um, I put some slides together uh, that uh, I think help tell the story. And this story starts on a beautiful main island called Hog Island. Uh, some of you no doubt have been there in the past as, as a camper taking our uh, sessions, our resident programs. But what brought me to Hog Island was to be the bird life instructor there in 1969. And as I was, as you heard, I was from Ohio originally. So but one of my dreams was always to come to uh, the main coast and to learn about the birds. I came and I saw the Maine coast in 1969 through the eyes of, a, of a, a biologist who was seeing what was there then, but I had no idea what used to be on this coast until I started reading uh, books like um, Maine Birds by uh, Ralph Palmer. And I began to hear stories about the birds that used to be here, and those included puffins and razorbills and gannets and perhaps even uh, great auks. All these great um, species, wonderful species, had changed. What I saw were black guillemots, as I'm holding here. I saw um, great blackback gulls and herring gulls. And I began learning about this amazing history about how people had slaughtered these birds. Uh, not for ill intent, but for, for economy, for purpose of decorating hats, for earning a livelihood, and they took their eggs and they took their, the chicks and they shot the birds for, for meat until they were almost all gone. I learned that from reading uh, the history that there was one surviving relic population out on Matinicus Rock and that population was down to only one or maybe two pairs uh, by uh, 1901. Somehow that colony had persisted and to me, that was a reminder that, well, maybe the other lost colonies could return. I had learned that not far from Hog Island, there was a colony on Eastern Egg Rock, but they were long gone. What I found there were gulls. And I began teasing together this story about why they never came back on their own. Gulls, it turns out, of course, are highly opportunistic. Uh, they feed in landfills and garbage dumps and I, in the 60s, late 60s, I didn't have to travel very far to see that there were lots of gulls feeding in open landfills within a few wing flaps of egg rock. And they would cough up uh, all kinds of refuse on the island, uh, pellets of aluminum foil and plastic uh, that they collected just a few miles away. And even closer, there was an abundance of food being spread over the ocean by uh, the local fishing boats. Um, and ironically, uh, that was a uh, herring, high quality herring. And to this day, most of the herring in the Gulf of Maine is captured as fishing bait, which is changing the food availability for seabirds, something we'll return to later in this story. Gulls being gulls, uh, of course, they're native wildlife, but this was a conundrum. We couldn't have all these gulls and ever hope to reinsert lost species like puffins because gulls eat um, puffins, they eat terns, and they, like great horned owls, are serious top-down predators. While the great uh, blackback and herring gulls are increasing offshore, great horned owls were doing the same thing in the dark on the mainland. The regrowth of secondary forests was just what great horned owls needed, and they were flying out to islands uh, predating on uh, ocean birds. So the birds were getting nailed from 
uh, big predators from above and below the food chain, offshore and inshore. I began uh, my work about the same time the Peregrine Fund was trying to restore peregrine falcons to the eastern United States. Uh, I was a grad student at Cornell. I met Tom Cade. I was very impressed by that effort to bring back the noble peregrine falcon that was extinct. Peregrine falcons lived on this coast, um, but they had been killed off by DDT. They were protected from that chemical, but they weren't coming back. This picture shows a peregrine up high and shows the, uh, to me, this represents this top down effect of a predator on a colony. Here's a group of terns flying up to try to chase away a peregrine falcon from its nesting islands. But the peregrine, if it wants, usually wins the battle with the terns. And the successful restoration of peregrine falcons has turned out to be yet another deterrent to restoring uh, terns and puffins on this coast. There is room for both, and I'll explain how that can happen. But it's interesting that one person's conservation vision can conflict with another conservation vision, and restoration biologists more and more are aware of the delicate balance that their programs must interplay if they are to both succeed. Another dramatic success story that we've all witnessed on this coast has been the resurgence of bald eagles. When I came to Hog Island in 1969, bald eagles were uh, a legendary bird, like the great rock, you know, the the mythical bird. The, the people just talked about the days when, when uh, bald eagles nested in Muscongas Bay. They were long gone, but I've seen them come back, bird by bird, and I've also seen that they have added their power, their enormous power, uh, as a factor affecting seabird restoration on this coast. They love to eat fish, by the way, and as long as there's abundant fish, bald eagles seem to prefer those. But when the fish are not so abundant, they are a generalist predator like gulls, and they can readily turn to nail a uh, cormorant, which is almost as big as, as they are. When you are uh, the top predator in a, in a food web, <clears throat> you pretty much have your choice of whatever you want to eat. This story of fish <clears throat> and birds, and seabirds in particular, has, was not so obvious to me when I first started seabird restoration on this coast. But more and more, I am aware of the delicate interplay between fisheries management and bird conservation. Both, of course, rely on clear, clean waters and healthy habitats, and people are affecting everything along the way. In Damerscotta Mills, there's this spectacle every spring of the return of the Aowives of Damerscotta Lake. This is a photograph that uh, Don and I saw just last spring as the, the water darkens with fish. And to me, this is a reminder of, of the terrific abundance that this coast can support if we give it a chance if we give it a chance. And then all birds, all seabirds, have this high protein choice. Uh, and I think when they have that choice that most of them probably would prefer to eat a fresh fish as this uh, herring gall is doing. After all, it is a herring gall and, and these river run herring is what they are, have bet long been associated with. And yet look what's happened to the coast. This is just one river system, the Penobscot River system. Um, one of um, uh, Dr. Stenix from the University of Maine students put this uh, graph or this chart together showing the river blockages. These are dams on the tributaries of the Penobscot. There's almost 200 of them that block almost every small little tributary for mills uh, along the rivers all the way up to the absolute headwaters and out into islands. Um, little wonder that herring, river run herring, have been depleted, as have ocean herring. And little wonder that birds are turning to birds to eat rather than to fish. 
against this backdrop, I, I wanted to do a simple thing. I wanted to bring puffins back. It seemed so straightforward to me at the time, but I didn't realize any of that about the galls and the fish. And I didn't realize about mammal resurgence either. Mink were depleted because of hunting and deforestation along the coast, but they're back now. And they actually define which islands birds can nest on. They can swim up to uh, 20, up to two miles offshore. And their big brother, the river otter, can also swim offshore. And we've seen them attack puffins. Um, so that's it's a fierce predator. Um, they have their place along the coast. So with all this background, how can you hope to, ever hope to bring back seabirds? If I knew all that, maybe this wouldn't have started this, this journey, uh, improbable quest, I, I call it. But there's egg rock um, <clears throat> off of Hog Island in the middle of the uh, screen there. My cursor will show you uh, that <clears throat> little rock. It's only seven acres in size. It's a classic seabird island on the main coast. You know, seabirds only breed on about 200 of Maine's nearly 4,000 uh, islands because an island has to be far enough to get away from all the mink along the coast and other predators. Uh, including great horned owls. This is egg rock, no trees, not an easy landing. Um, in 1974, we set up a field camp. We felt like pioneers on the moon. Um, the locals told us, you can't live on that rock, but I didn't know any better. And we set up a tent out there. And since 1974, every summer, even this summer, we have had people living um, on the island. First in a tent camp, now in a little a building that we um, nostalgically call the Egg Rock Hilton. It has become home to the future generations of seabird uh, biologists. The puffins. I needed to learn as much as I could about puffins in order to start this project. I learned that they come to land just to nest, that they have little chicks that they grow underground. They hatch one egg each year. Both parents take turns rearing the chick. And the chick then heads off to sea, taking a memory with it about where its home was. That's about all I knew when Project Puffin started about the life history. And I knew that the chicks generally came back to breed uh, at the site they left from. With that idea, I collected uh, all the necessary permits. We took about uh, 20 different permits and arranged after several years to collect a handful of chicks in Newfoundland, uh, Canada, with the, in cooperation with the Canadian Wildlife Service. They were flown to Maine starting in 1973. And by 1981, we had moved about a thousand puffin chicks from Newfoundland to Eastern Egg Rock. They were raised in sod burrows and fed a diet of thawed fish with vitamin supplements until they were about um, six weeks old and they look like this. They have transformed from the fuzzy little chick to a, um, a sturdy uh, water bird capable of shedding water. Uh, no colors on the beak or the feet at this stage, all dressed for battle of survival at sea. No reason to have bright colors because that has to do with breeding uh, and mate selection. They disappeared at sea until 1977 when I began putting up the first decoys. On Eastern Egg Rock, we hadn't seen anything show up from 1973 when we moved the first six uh, chicks to 1976, nothing had come back. So 77 was a real turning point for the project. We had to prove to our, our supporters that something, some glimmer of hope was in this project. And so I turned to decoys, um, perhaps out of desperation. Uh, I had to try to think like a puffin as best I could. And I knew they were colonial. I knew they like each other. I knew that they usually came back, young ones, to join existing colonies. So I put up decoys. Simple idea that turned out to pay off. When I noticed that the birds would get bored with the decoys and often fly away after a uh, a short visit, I put up mirrors to be a more active stimulation, a more active decoy, hoping to attract more birds. And in this picture by 19, 
80, you can see there's a lot of two-legged puffins among the decoys. By the way, if you ever go run egg rock on a puffin tour, beware, there are still some one-legged decoys out there. But they never fly and they never have two legs. 1981 was another big landmark for Project Puffin when we had a puffin fly in with its fish uh, in its beak and it was banded and it dropped under a rock and that was our, our clue, our, our seminal discovery that puffins were in fact breeding again on egg rock. It had been nearly a hundred years since the original population had been exterminated from, from hunting by spreading nets over the rocks and trapping the birds for food. A hundred years of gulls living on the island that kept terns and puffins from coming back. The puffin dropped under the rocks, disappeared with the fish, and then it um, popped out without the fish. And that was the signal that there was a chick. With the successes at Egg Rock that followed over the years, I was uh, heartened to try a second restoration project for puffins on Seal Island, which is a national wildlife refuge in outer Penobscot Bay. We built a little cabin modeled after the Egg Rock Hilton, 12 by 12, tent camps for the uh, researchers that live on the island. And we moved an additional thousand puffin chicks between 1984 and 1989 moving 200 of them at a time, hand rearing them on frozen fish. It was an extraordinary uh, feat uh, to do that, looking back on it. Meanwhile, we were trying to see if we could help turns. The turn restoration project that we have worked on over the years was in part to try to help the puffins initially because turns nest on the surface and they're very aggressive when predators get near their surface nesting chicks. We could see that whenever a herring gull, for example, would come near a tern colony, the terns would hammer that gull and chase it away. Not all the gulls were chased off, but some of them were, and that was a good thing. Likewise, even the big bald eagles uh, could be chased off by terns. Not so much peregrines, but they, they were good at chasing gulls and, and eagles. To attract the terns, we used decoys, because we were already confident. This was in 1979 when we started the decoy work with turns. And we put out sound speakers, a new twist, because unlike puffins, turns are very noisy in their colonies. We wanted this to sound like a welcoming colony. A silent turn colony often means that there's a predator nearby. So we wanted to make sure that there was turn calls playing day and night. We noticed that uh, turn males would often try to feed females or feed the decoys as if they were females, something we never saw puffins do, but that's not part of the puffin uh, culture. Wing flagging like this is an aggressive display to chase away a decoy. That was a good sign. It meant the turn was starting to think of this as its territory. Of course, the decoy didn't budge. Even these stylized uh, decoys uh, just a simple decoy with a, made out of dowel rods and a piece of two by four seemed to elicit aggressive displays. Again, a reminder that uh, we were onto something important here. And, and this, this uh, discovery uh, proved itself after we finally figured out how to keep the, the sound system rolling day and night uh, with turns nesting right near the decoys. First uh, common in Arctic terns, uh, and later uh, roseate turns. So at this point, um, we, wanna, we wanna let you participate with this lecture. Rather than me tell you just information, uh, Don and I have some questions in our poll, and, and they, they're called poll questions. And the way this will work is for you to um, see which of these uh, techniques uh, is, is, works best. Um, what would be a good name for this uh, method of attracting uh, seabirds? Would this be um, that we call social attraction? What, what, what really is that? Giving you just a few seconds. 
the social traction has turned out to be maybe our best uh, discovery and all the techniques because as I'll show you later on it's now used worldwide. All right, I think uh, we have uh, given people a chance. Oh, that was, boy, what a bright group this is. Nobody thought it was a party game or the same as chick translocation. You got it. Uh, social attraction. Thank you for paying attention and for um, getting all that straight. Okay, we're gonna move forward here, I think. All right, there's the roseate tern, one of our, uh, an endangered species in Maine that nests now all of them on actively managed islands along this coast. So while we have been learning about puffin restoration, we've also been learning about what puffins do at sea it was a mystery for the longest time to uh, where the puffins went until we started using these geolocators. This is a device that measures the length of the day. And here's, here's the results of, of the travels of one of those puffins. Left the main coast, it flew to Labrador, it went up into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and then it went out to the edge of the continental shelf this area in yellow is the new national, Marine National Monument. And then it went back to uh, Seal Island where it started. That was year one. Now watch what happens with the travels of this same bird because this geolocator stayed on the leg of the bird two years before it was recovered. Notice how it tends to roughly repeat where it went. It's like some people do on their winter vacation, they go to the same spot year after year. Well, this bird's, I don't know if it's a vacation out there, but notice how it re basically repeated itself the second year before it went back to Seal Island. Um, it's as, as seabird migrations go, actually even as puffin migrations go, Gulf of Maine puffins are pretty much stay at home birds. One of the great outcomes of this is that the puffins visited um, this, this area that was already recognized as an important marine habitat, the uh, Northeast Canyons and Seamounts uh, Marine National Monument is the name that, uh, that it has, uh, about 5,000 acres of very important high biodiversity habitat that President Obama uh, named as a marine national monument, the only one of its kind on the, on the uh, East Coast. Um, that area is presently uh, being challenged um, in court and we're gonna count on people that care about seabirds to help save it. It's not just about seabirds, it's about oceans, fish, ocean habitats. Okay, we've got another question just came up here. So let's see uh, what, uh, what you do with this question. This question relates to the um, topic, and here it is. All right, boy. We of course, not all puffins do the same thing. The, the, the uh, bird I showed you was just one bird. Uh, they don't all do it. They, do, they tend to do the same thing for multiple years, but, but not the same thing. This one, this was split a little further and actually Labrador and Newfoundland are actually the same province. So those people said uh, Newfoundland are, are correct. Uh, those people that said Gulf of St. Lawrence, Gulf of Maine, um, got the majority there. Uh, and that is in fact where the bird spends the most of its time. Uh, so you're all right. And uh, thank you again for paying attention. <laughs> okay, we're gonna keep moving here. Um, 
we'll talk a little bit more about turns. We'll turn off that um, those summaries. You know, terns are famous for being long distance migrants. Notice the geolocator on the, chat, on the leg of this Arctic tern. We knew they, they travel a long way, but we didn't know where they go or the extent of this. And we have to, I got to reactivate uh, my control here, Todd, to advance that slide, if you can help with that. This little device does not encumber the bird, especially attached to its leg like that. And it's not much heavier than a, um, than a leg band. Yeah, Steve, I'm not quite sure why you're not able to advance your slide. Um, okay, let advancing. me just uh, click on it. Maybe that'll help. Oh, that did it. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay, so this, this hodgepodge of color here is actually the, the migration of five different Arctic terns. This area in the Gulf of Maine, notice that's where they leave from. That's Eastern Egg Rock in the middle of it. Follow just one of these, just as an example. The yellow bird flew to the uh, middle of the, the Atlantic Ocean. That turns out to be a very important marine area for lots of birds from both continents, both east and west side of the Atlantic. It flew down to Argentina, that area off of Argentina and in the Falkland Islands and up to the coast of the Valdez Peninsula, very important. It flew then to Antarctica, where most of these uh, Arctic terns from Maine go to the Weddell Sea. And then it flew back in a, in a figure eight uh, pattern uh, using wind currents and ocean currents to guide it, but they don't all do that. Notice the pink bird flew over to Africa instead and it disappears off the chart up here into the Indian Ocean and then back. They can fly 40,000 miles uh, in a year and they can live to be uh, 30 years of age uh, to the moon and back a couple of times. And each bird is flying sort of a different path, though it does tend to repeat as this graph shows. In two years, uh, the same bird flew in to Antarctica Repeat, following its same path. They don't, if it went to Argentina the first year, it'll probably go back to Argentina the second year. Maine is also um, the only state where Manx shearwaters breed, and there's only one island that we know of in Maine where Manx shearwaters breed, and this is Matinicus rock. Um, and look at that big fuzzy chick. That is the young of a Manx shearwater. It's being banded with a geolocator. And we've discovered that they have this amazing migration as well. Uh, they don't go quite as far as Arctic terns, but they fly all the way down to Argentina as well. In that area off of Punta Valdez in Southern Argentina is their winter home. Interesting enough, the European uh, population of Manx shearwaters goes to that very same spot and they, and they mix in the winter with, their, with the European birds. Perhaps our main birds are, are got here because the European birds actually, it turns out, fly home to Europe via the, the, uh, the northeast coast of the U.S. Just a couple of examples how we've used these uh, methods elsewhere in the world. This is a map showing the locations of restoration projects. And these seabird uh, projects here um, now shows uh, so different locations. Notice that a lot of them are in on the main coast um, or in the United States where, where social attraction had its origins, but these projects are now scattered all over. This is part of a, of a, a new project uh, with the Packard Foundation funding and Pacific Rim, um, a Hawaiian based group that's collecting seabird restoration projects worldwide and we're discovering more and more people. And all this happened, all this started on Eastern Egg Rock. Uh, and our program in Bremen continues to participate in these international programs at many levels, including producing decoys, made in Maine decoys. Yep, right there in Bremen, there's Sue Schubel. 
uh, creating great crested tern decoys and common myrrh eggs uh, out of recycled uh, plastic. And she's uh, developed a new uh, type of mirror box because mirrors, it turns out, are, are very attractive to all kinds of birds. And these decoys and mirror boxes are now being shipped worldwide. One of the first places we exported these techniques to was on in California in the, um, the project on Devil Slide Rock. This black line shows the oil slick from the Apex Houston oil that soaked this coast um, after a spill in 1982. This is what this, the colony on Devil Slide Rock looked like before the oil spill. Uh, when it was crowded uh, with shoulder to shoulder common MERS after the oil spill, when some 7,000 MERS died, they disappeared. It was a, it was a enormous labor of love, skill, and danger to uh, restore birds to this island. Uh, look at the surf breaking here. It took talented Zodiac drivers to land people to climb and mountain climbers to install uh, the decoys, but it worked. The same year we started this project, a pair of MERS came back and raised chicks. They've been gone for 10 years, just waiting for the decoys, it seems. Before the um, oil spill, now after the oil spill. You can't tell the difference because a lot of dedicated people tried to make a difference and did. Um, that project helped to encourage other projects in the Pacific, including a project with short-tailed albatross in Japan. Torishima Island, a volcanic island, uh, was the home of, of um, several million albatross that were slaughtered for feathers until Hiroshi Hasegawa started protecting that colony. And he put up lifelike decoys on Torishima Island. And he helped arrange a translocation project where chicks were flown off of the active volcano to a non-volcanic island, hand fed and released. And these chicks are now coming back to breed on a new island. So these methods have gotten as far away as, as um, Japan and now also in China with the rediscovery of the, of the Chinese crested tern. The bird thought to be extinct for 70 years until Chinese biologists uh, decided they would try their hand at social attraction and they set out decoys and they played sound recordings. And um, and you can see here a Chinese crested tern that's very interested in a decoy. It's so interested in the decoy that it, it's ignoring this female Chinese crested tern. But, you know, eventually they, they figured it out. And here's, here's a pair of Chinese crested terns with their chick. What have we learned about puffins beyond this? I can't go through it all. This project is too long and complicated, but um, in too many chapters, but you can read the book and I hope you'll buy this from Project Puffin Visitor Center. We ship these books out um, to people that, that wanna help the project. Puffins on egg rock have increased consistently. Last year, 188 pairs. And on Seal Island, the sister project, they've increased over 500 pairs. This is all good news. But there's so much that, that we haven't learned yet. And I, and I, wanna, I wanna share um, the, the, the uh, rest of this time now with Don, who will tell us about some of the new directions the project is going and some of the new discoveries. I'll, I'll advance for you, Don, so just, just let me know when I should advance. Okay, well, thanks, Steve. Um, and thanks, everyone, for the opportunity to share a little bit about what we're learning from, from puffins and the other birds. As Steve mentioned, even though we've learned so much, there still are uh, some things we don't know. Um, this photo uh, shows myself uh, and Annette Fayette, a, a really leading, uh, cutting edge scholar from uh, Oxford in, in the UK who came to Maine to work with us to tag puffins. We're each holding a very small miniaturized GPS tag. I think the next photo actually is a close-up 
uh, of uh, that tag in our hand. It's about the size of a dime. Um, and we're using tags like these to track puffins while they're feeding chicks. Uh, the next slide shows a photo uh, of some of the tracking data uh, there on the right uh, from birds nesting at Matinicus Rock. And you can see in the left there uh, that uh, we take that tag to the feathers on the puffin's back. So it's, it's a nicely temporary attachment of the tag. Uh, and uh, it's a way for us to track them with really good precision and see where they're going uh, to get food for their chicks, what kind of habitats they're using, um, how do those areas overlap with areas of fishing interests. And that. so we're really learning a lot about uh, puffin ecology um, that we can uh, use to uh, better predict what challenges they'll face uh, as the, the oceans warm and how we can help mitigate those challenges. Uh, let's look at the next slide. Yeah, here's, here's another track. This, this is uh, some of the, the data from the same island, and you can see how puffins will loop around uh, on some of their foraging trips. Uh, they'll stop and do some foraging close to the island, but sometimes are much farther away, uh, potentially uh, 30 kilometers or more away from the island where they nest. And that distance is really important. Uh, flight for puffins uh, is very energy intensive, and the farther they have to go, um, that's more work for the adults and also takes more time. Um, if they have to go quite far, they uh, uh, feed their chicks less, uh, which is uh, a, a challenge. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and as I mentioned, we're very interested in the impacts of climate going forward, as are uh, you know so many. Uh, next slide. The Gulf of Maine is a really uh, interesting and a unique area. Uh, for the latitude that we're at here. Um, it's historically been cooler water uh, for this latitude, which has allowed uh, some northern species like puffins, like those Arctic terns uh, that, that we saw tracks from, from Steve, um, to nest this far south. Uh, most of the population of these species is, is to the north of us here, but we're at the southern end, um, and that uh, makes us a great bellwether, if you will, uh, for the challenges the entire species uh, will face uh, as climate warms. Next slide. Yeah, this explains part of why uh, the Gulf of Maine is unusual. Um, it, it's kind of the, the merging point of two distinct currents, the Labrador Current, which comes down along coastal Canada. It is cold water. Uh, and the Gulf Stream, uh, which comes, along, comes up along our Atlantic coast here in the U.S. Um, historically, that Labrador current was the more dominant force, carried in more cold water um, and more cold water plankton, which are especially good, um, and the Gulf Stream was less dominant. But as, as our climate has warmed, the Gulf Stream has moved north, and become a more dominant force here. We get more water coming into the Gulf of Maine from the Gulf Stream, and that's made the Gulf of Maine a very rapidly warming place. Uh, next slide. And this figure really shows just how fast we are warming here. Um, that blue line in that figure um, is kind of the global average ocean temperature, and you can see it is rising. Um, but the red line here is our situation in the Gulf of Maine. And you can see that in recent years, we're really warming much more rapidly than the global average. Um, and that's uh, in part, you know, the world is warming, but that's also the impact of that Gulf Stream current water uh, coming into the Gulf and really warming it much more rapidly. Um, next slide. Yeah, and of course, warming, the ocean warming has a big impact on all the critters, all the fish and other species that live in the ocean or get food from the ocean. Um, and 
one thing that we're starting to see is a lot of fish populations move north um, and move offshore. These two graphs um, show that in a, in a quantitative sense. Um, the map on the right uh, shows increases uh, in red, decreases in blue. Uh, and what I want to draw your attention to is that little circle at the top of the map. There's a little bit of blue close to the main coast, and that's fish moving away from the coast and away from coastal islands where puffins and other seabirds nest. And that's a concerning point or a concerning observation we're making. Um, if those fish move far from our colonies, the adult puffins have farther to go, they feed their chicks less, and, and raising chicks becomes much more of a struggle. Uh, next slide. This is another depiction of warming temperatures in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, this is a really famous uh, figure uh, that was put together by folks at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, uh, and just another indication of how quickly uh, we're, we're seeing the Gulf of Maine increase and how much we need to understand that and respond to that if we can. Next slide. Yeah, so what we're doing in response to that is getting back to work. And for us uh, and the researchers that work on our islands, our island interns, we call them, that's tracking what, what our seabirds are eating um, and using that information to understand how the ocean's changing and uh, to predict what, what a future may look like for some of our species. So here's our egg rock hilton, right back to egg rock. Uh, next slide. Uh, and we have researchers hard at work, actually, even as we're talking today, um, we have folks out at uh, egg rock. This is inside the egg rock hilton where we have uh, both a kitchen, an office, and, and laboratory facilities of a sort. Um, and uh, this researcher is hard at work entering data that they've been collecting. And the data that I want to talk about today, it, we, we collect that as seen in the next slide uh, by sitting in blinds and observing uh, birds you know, relatively up close. Um, and we typically use uh, excellent optics or, or even more often good cameras with really good lenses um, to photograph the fish that birds are bringing back to feed their chicks. Uh, the next couple slides uh, show puffins coming back with um, a variety of fish. We see puffins relying historically on herring, um, but they also uh, are, are, can do very well uh, using hake or haddock. Next slide. Uh, haddock has been a particularly uh, uh, beneficial fish this year, for example. But not all of the fish we see are great fish to be feeding chicks. Uh, in the next slide, we have a couple examples of what we call junk food. <laughs> and those are fish that are, are important e ecologically, but not very useful to seabirds raising chicks. On the left, you see a butterfish, which is actually a quite nutritious fish, but you can see from this photo, it, it's oddly shaped. Uh, it's what we call deep bodied or very uh, tall top to bottom. Um, and when, the, when a puffin holds it like this, uh, it, it's very wide side to side. Um, and uh, in the photo on the right, we see some very small fish, um, sticklebacks, puffer fish, uh, things that, that don't have much nutritional quality. And when adult puffins and turns bring these kinds of fish back to their chicks, uh, there, there, is, there just isn't the benefit that we see with, with the better quality fish. The next slide actually shows a, a pretty graphic example uh, of a chick trying to eat one of these oddly shaped butterfish. Uh, and Steve, I think, is uh, turning on the video. And, and you can see this chick is struggling and, and really unable to get that fish down um, because of that odd shape. So when adults bring in these fish by mistake, um, they, they really are no, of no benefit to the chicks and represent some wasted time and, 
energy on the part of the parents. So these warm water fish can really cause challenges. Um, as I mentioned, haddock are a, a particularly beneficial fish this year um, and a species that has really recovered well um, because we've done a good job of managing it the last couple of decades. Um, the Magnuson-Stevens Act was an important fisheries conservation act passed actually decades ago in the 70s. Um, but when it is applied well to a species that becomes overfished, it ensures the recovery of that fish population. And haddock are a great example uh, of that, uh, that, that puffins and seabirds can take advantage of. Of course, puffins and terns are eating the younger age classes uh, of this species, uh, not the larger haddock that, that we enjoy ourselves. Um, the next slide shows another species. Oh, no, the next slide is a poll question. Um, so I think Todd can set that up um, and we can see what people think. So just to read the question, a warmer water fish that is sometimes too large for puffins chicks to swallow is known as, and I'll give, I'll give everyone a few moments to cast their vote. The options here are all pretty fun ones. Uh, excellent. Uh, yes, definitely a butterfish, um, although Certainly a bummer fish is a good descriptor <laughs> for that fish as well. <laughs> so, thanks. Uh, and we can go ahead to the next slide. Yeah, uh, okay, we'll just jump into uh, another way we study puffins in great detail. And that's actually through some community science efforts that we have. Uh, we have several webcams. Uh, this one is out on Seal Island. Um, and uh, everyone can view these uh, individual puffins uh, at explore.org. Um, and one camera is trained on a puffin burrow, and we see just how often that chick is fed across the entire season. So we get way more detail on that chick um, than we have the time and, and capacity to do uh, for other birds. And we can learn a lot just by watching an individual that kind of explains larger patterns we see in, across a whole colony, for example. So this figure shows in the blue bars the number of times per day uh, of one of these webcam chicks um, gets fed. Uh, this was the chick Grace in 2018. And you can see a pattern in those blue bars. Um, those bars were generally higher early in the season in early July, um, and then drop uh, to a lower level in the latter half of July and early August, and then ramped back up to even a higher level uh, in August. And if you overlay the temperature of the water, the temperature of the ocean on top of that, that's the orange line, um, if you overlay those, you can see that the feeding rate really dropped when we saw this marine heat wave, this heat spike um, in, in the ocean. Um, and we know that that led to fish moving further offshore and into deeper water, which those factors combined make it just much more work and much harder for puffins to catch them um, and bring them back to feed their chicks. So Grace was a fortunate chick in this particular year. Her parents were able to get just enough food to keep her going. Not every chick got enough fish to keep them going. But uh, at the end of the marine heat wave, she was still alive, but hadn't grown up at a normal rate. You can see in the left photo here, she was still very fuzzy, very downy, didn't have the plumage that uh, would keep her, uh, her waterproof uh, when she went to the ocean. Uh, but her parents were able to recover when the temperature got cooler um, and fish came back closer to Seal Island. Um, and by the end of August, uh, Grace was looking like a very healthy uh, chick and was ready to go and did fledge. Um, so uh, there's definitely some concern here 
about warming oceans and these marine heat waves. Puffins, however, uh, have a lot of capacity and uh, can make adjustments within limits. Um, and we're really interested in exploring just how flexible and how much uh, capacity they have to adjust to climate change. Um, that's a big future goal for us. Uh, next slide. Oh, we're ready for another poll question. Okay. So what do you think is happening with marine heat waves? Um, they certainly uh, have a lot of impacts on our marine ecosystem. Um, and you might guess uh, that um, we're seeing them more frequently, perhaps. Um, I spoke to their effects on fish. Uh, I didn't mention their effects on primary productivity, but let's just suffice to say that it's, it's not good. <laughs> uh, so yeah, think that over. This is a really important question as we move forward for, with seabirds um, and, and uh, all of our marine species. And yes, of course, uh, uh, all of those answers were correct. Uh, marine heat waves are happening more frequently and really have very significant impacts across the ecosystem. Um, and so definitely a concern as we move forward um, and, and try and figure out how we're going to uh, mitigate for the effects of climate change. Why don't we move on to our next slide? Yeah, um, so some ways we actually can mitigate uh, for the effects of climate change are to do a lot of the things that we know how to do from Steve's work, uh, from his career. And that's have people out on islands protecting the seabirds from uh, the predators that, that could come uh, to bother them. The next slide shows a, a graphic example of that, a great black-backed gull here, um, uh, uh, which is uh, preyed on a, a, a juvenile tern. Um, the next slide is another uh, predator that Steve mentioned. Um, if we were not out on the islands, uh, bald eagles and these other predators would become significant problems again. This eagle is actually on the Egg Rock Hilton, and we see this regularly when our island researchers move off the island at the end of the season. As we're leaving the island, we're often seeing eagles come and land on the island, on the Hilton, um, and look to reestablish uh, their uh, dominance in that space. So our presence is really important. And we'll continue to experiment with novel ways to do that. Um, this was a creative uh, idea about uh, using a, a, a mannequin uh, with some motion um, to uh, pretend to be an island intern. Um, we're always looking for good ideas on how to help uh, deter predators. Uh, but returning to our story at Egg Rock, uh, we know that we need to be focused uh, and help these seabirds. These species are what we can call conservation reliant at this, at this time. If we walked away, we know that we would lose many of these species. So we're committed to keeping researchers on the islands um, collecting data, protecting birds, uh, protecting uh, uh, birds like the, the young bird in the next slide. Um, uh, uh, here's one of our interns holding a, a puffling that's getting close uh, to fledging. Um, and so we're really indebted to the young people that come to work with us. Uh, and uh, that, that group it is you know, really going to carry the legacy of this program forward. But we're also trying to reach you know, a variety of audiences. Um, here's a tour boat, which in better times we might have been on today. Uh, but Egg Rock is, is now a center of ecotourism and education of those tourists, um, which is very important to maintain uh, the support for conservation efforts. Next slide. We also educate and inform <laughs> very diverse groups. Here's Sue Schubel, uh, who you saw in an earlier slide, 
uh, conducting a classroom program at a school here in coastal Maine. Um, certainly educating students, young people, is critical to ensuring our conservation future. Next slide. We also continue that educational program or add to that educational program at our Hog Island camp. Um, our camp is not open uh, for face-to-face -face courses this year, but we are conducting some virtual courses. Um, if you're interested, you can find those uh, at the website here listed on that slide. But we're trying to reach diverse audiences, uh, both uh, uh, across um, uh, different age groups uh, and different um, kind of cultural, ethnic, and racial backgrounds. So we're, we're trying to spread the word, much like we are today in this webinar, of seabird conservation um, and ecosystem management uh, to as many people as we can. Uh, and I think the next slide is our, our wrap up and we could move to questions. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Donald and, and Stephen, for your excellent presentations this afternoon. Um, and thanks uh, to everyone who's, who's joined us for this last hour. Um, we're going to take about 15 minutes for questions. Again, if you have a question for either uh, Stephen or Donald, please type it in the Q&A box down below, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can in the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Um, so, Steve, this first question is for you. It's from uh, Desiree Berger, who asks a question about uh, the geolocator that you mentioned in your presentation. She's wondering how much that geolocator weighs. Um, and a similar question, um, also from Desiree, is um, was that geolocator invented by your team? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Desiree. Uh, the, uh, the geolocator weighs about five grams, uh, less than the weight of a nickel. And the uh, we did not... Um, invent this, but we did uh, pioneer some of the early, earliest versions of these. Um, in fact, some of the earliest ones uh, didn't work at all. They leaked and we lost several years of data. So like most things that we, we did, um, we were pioneers of it. And, uh, and th that was the first discovery of where puffins travel in the winter. And it, it was amazing, the story we we have, and we've also participated with Annette uh, Fayette uh, in, in her uh, Across the Atlantic program. So that, that data was published as part of a larger uh, study that she did, and that's why I, I mentioned how our puffins are pretty much stay-at-home birds compared to <laughs> others. Great. Um, and one other question actually came in about geolocators. Um, Dina is wondering if uh, any of the birds don't tolerate those monitors uh, and if they uh, refuse to, to wear them. Um, thank you, Dina. The, um, the puffin geolocators um, of this size group are very successful. We had, I don't think any birds abandon um, their, their chicks or um, show uh, intolerance with, with the geolocators. And and that was a, a terrific relief to us because going to all this trouble to um, uh, restore birds, of course, we didn't want to do anything that would compromise them. So the fact that they came back to their burrows to feed their chicks is how we were able to recover the, the, the puffins. And because and, we have to take those tags off and snap them off the leg. Um, and, then, uh, and then of course, we don't put anything back on that bird again, but we need to have the bird come home and, and they would come home to feed their, the next year's chick. And that's how we were able to recover them. So we're very pleased with how the geolocators work from a disturbance standpoint. Excellent, thank you. Um, Donald, this next question is for you. It's for, uh, from Pamela, who's wondering if the water that's brought down to Maine by the Labrador current is also warming um, uh, in, in addition to uh, the Gulf Stream water that, that's uh, of course coming, coming north into Maine. Great. Yeah, thanks for that question, Pamela. Um, the Labrador current is warming, um, not quite at the same rate um, as the Gulf of Maine. Um, it, it's kind of tracking the average global warming we're seeing across the entire planet. Um, and what we're really seeing is just, uh, it, that would warm the Gulf of Maine 
kind of at a, a, a slow rate, slow pace, uh, similar to the global average. Um, but just the, the difference in which current is coming into the Gulf of Maine more is causing our area to warm so much faster. Um, another aspect uh, of this that uh, there isn't time to get into in too much detail, but the Labrador currents also becoming fresher as we see warmer temp air temperatures melting glaciers um, and, and that it's becoming a fresher water current, which changes the ecosystem in some unexpected ways as well. Great, thank you. Um, Stephen, I'm going to pitch this question to you. There's a couple of questions coming in actually about um, if uh, if puffin chicks uh, or or turn chicks perhaps ever uh, choke uh, or or perish from the the odd shaped fish that their uh, that their parents are bringing back to um, to them, uh, are, are we seeing these chicks choking or or unfortunately perishing from from these odd species of fish? If the um... The, the, if the chick can swallow these these big fish, then they generally benefit from them. And it's kind of a fine line. I mean, some butterfish are swallowed. It really depends on when they arrive. If if a big fish arrives too early to a young chick, it, it won't be able to swallow it. Um, choking per se, getting it, the fish stuck in the throat is is rare. It has happened. Um, but more frequently, the problem is that it's just not enough other fish coming in. And so uh, the researchers report finding piles of butterfish in some of the burrows. And that's a burrow that may lead to uh, the chick not making it, um, unfortunately. So it's a question of, uh, it's a delicate question. And it's really an interesting question about how a species of butterfish is responding to, to uh, warmer water and the puffins doesn't have the behavior, the puffin adult doesn't have the behavior to tear up the fish. In that video, you can see the puffin parent just looking out to see it did its job, it brought the fish back, but it doesn't have the behaviors or the tools to tear up fish like an osprey would for its chick. Hmm. Great, thank you. Um, Donald, this next question is for you, it's from uh, Deanna. Um, it's actually a question from her daughter, Louisa, who is age six, uh, who's wondering how much puffin eggs weigh uh, and how large they are. You know, I don't know off the top of my head, maybe Steve knows that off the top of his head. Um, it, it would probably be, well, get, go ahead, Steve, before I speculate. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually not going <laughs> to speculate on the weight either. That's a really good question. I think she stumped us both uh, with the weight maybe, but we can find out. But I can tell you this much that uh, just size-wise, if you were to compare a puffin egg to a chicken egg, it's about the size of an extra large grade chicken egg. And, and equally interesting to me is the egg makes up about 15% of the female's body weight. So from that, we could probably figure out. Um, I mean, a female puffin's probably 450 grams, so 15% of that, um, 45 to 50, 50 some grams probably. But the, um, you can picture it, uh, the size of an extra large chicken egg. And that's why it's so important that the females have enough food to produce that egg. They won't lay a second egg if the egg is lost either. It's too much of a job to produce it. They'll take a year off instead. Great. Um, this next question, I'll pitch it to both of you. And uh, just a question about the puffin signature orange beaks. I'm uh, just wondering, uh, you know, why their beaks are orange and maybe how they get that way. Well, I'll, I'll give a crack at it first. And Don, you can add to it. Um, they probably get the bright colors from the diet. Uh, we know that uh, eating shrimps and planktons have a, a lot of carotene in them. So bright colors uh, for marine birds probably come from that. Um, it, it serves some um, measure of, for evidence of uh, age, because the young birds that are not pre-breeding pre age or even pre-courting age don't have the colors. So age and also the beak changes not just in color, but in the ornateness of the ridges on the beak. And that's another measure of a puffin's 
age and status. And other puffins probably uh, use these as clues for mate selection. And both the males and the females probably look at the other puffins and say, hmm, that's a good looking beak, I think. And also, uh, <laughs> these beaks tend to glow in the dark uh, because the yeah. bird can see in the ultraviolet uh, range more than we can. That's a recent discovery. Hmm. Great. Anything to add, Donald? No, I, I, other than just fascination with the bill, it, it really is amazing. And the recent discovery that Steve mentioned that they they fluoresce in the UV, you know, there's so much about their appearance that we probably aren't appreciating with our own eyes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Great. So folks, we have time for just a few more questions. If you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box. Uh, we're going to wrap up here in just a few minutes, but time for a few more questions. Um, Donald, I'm going to pitch this one to you. It's from Sarah Sweeney, who asks, uh, what can we as citizen scientists do to help seabirds like puffins and terns uh, here in Maine? What, what, can, uh, what can the average citizen scientist do? Right. Yeah, there's, there's some really great, great ways to contribute to uh, community science is what we, we call it within Audubon. Uh, but uh, it, a couple examples of that. Um, when, when you're out birding and you see birds, um, you can enter those data into the eBird uh, app or the eBird website just to help us understand the distribution of birds, where they are at what times of year, um, and create a database that we can use in the future to track how those distributions change. Um, and doing that from land is very helpful. Doing it if you're out boating, um, is really helpful because we get just much less information out on the water. Um, another, uh, uh, another aspect, so that um, feeding rate or, or number of feeds per day graph that I showed was compiled by uh, a community science uh, volunteer who religiously watched the Puffin webcam uh, and collected those data. Uh, and there are other examples out there of that. Um, you might look up or search on the word uh, seabird watch. Um, and there's, there's some other uh, fun examples of ways people contribute to counting seabird to colonies or tracking where they are. Excellent. Uh, anything to add, Steve, to that? I would, I would just add there are advocacy opportunities that come along that are very important, um, you know, protecting that Magnuson Stevens Fisheries Act is, is, is really important. It's, it's threatened now, uh, it's, it's their efforts to weaken it. And that's, I mean, the story of the haddock is, you couldn't have a, a clear story to my mind, uh, how without that, with the, the, the hake is moving out of range, the herring is overfished, um, but the haddock is strong and it's because of that law. So, Protecting that will be important. The, the, uh, the marine monument that we've talked about, you know, letters have, have supported that. That's going to the Supreme Court for a decision. So we're, we, there are lots of ways people can get involved. Of course, supporting Project Puffin, we are a nonprofit, is, is, continues to be important. Read my book. Uh, <laughs> people, authors always say that, uh, but it's uh, true. Um, and the, uh, and the other thing that uh, Don mentioned, we have online courses and, and uh, Don and I are just about ready to, to uh, release a new course called Puffin Islands that for this audience will be especially helpful. It's like a primer course in, in uh, seabird biology and Don and I and other puffin experts are, are the uh, speakers on that. So we'll be announcing that soon. Hope you'll uh, take that, but lots of ways to stay engaged. Well, that's great. Well, I think that's a great place to, to end it. And apologies to folks who asked a question. We didn't get it, a chance to answer it. Um, I'm going to uh, see if, if Steve and Donald uh, can re reply to your questions via email in, in the coming days. And uh, I sh I'm sure that both gentlemen would be happy to, to, to do that. So uh, just a quick, couple of quick closing remarks. Uh, again, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We would have loved to have been with you today in person out at Eastern Egg Rock to see these beautiful birds. But we appreciate you joining us online. Uh, you will receive an email tomorrow from me 
uh, with a link to the recording of this program. And so you're welcome to share that with your friends and family and certainly hope that you do. Uh, of course, uh, please visit Project Puffin and check out the great work that they're doing. Uh, read these the fine gentlemen's books and uh, continue to support uh, the good work that they're doing. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Steve and, and Donald and, and Allison, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your afternoon.